Many people are familiar with mindfulness meditation these days, as over the past few years, mindfulness has gone mainstream for the many advantages it has to offer. By simply breathing in and out, anyone can reap the benefits of practicing stillness and being present, yet it feels far more complex than that, as an entire marketplace of digital apps and guides has been designed to help with this. So even with such an abundance of resources at our fingertips, how come we're not all able to benefit from this wellness activity? Oftentimes, insight into the mechanism of action can do the trick and help you to get the most out of it. Since 1995, the number of high-quality randomized controlled trials studying mindfulness has gone nearly parabolic. And there's a wealth of information published that shows how and why mindfulness changes your mind and body, but it remains almost kind of locked away in the realms of academia instead of being directly applied to your life. My name is Dr. Jagtap, and I have a specialization in psychiatry with a background in neuroimaging and economics. And over the next few minutes, we're going to see how mindfulness meditation reverses the 51% attack and what that entails. So slowly breathing in and out is the simplest way to practice mindfulness as you focus or meditate on your breath as it flows in and out your nose continuously. And while you're doing this, eventually and inevitably, you'll find your mind wandering to something you remember from the past or maybe something you have to do in the future. It's kind of like getting a notification that you didn't ask for. So when this happens, you gently let go without judgment as you set the notification aside and regain your clarity. And it's important to do this without judgment because you want to avoid suppression, which will otherwise be counterproductive. After regaining clarity, you refocus on the breath and continue as you were. And while you're doing this, a number of interesting and important things are unfolding in your brain. So let's take a look. Meditating on your breath is a task you're actively engaged in. And this function is carried out by a network of brain regions called a task positive network. And the activity of this network goes down as your mind begins to wander. And instead, the activity of task negative networks goes up. It's called task negative because it's found to be active when we're aimlessly engaged in automatic or default thinking that contributes to those notifications. In fact, that's why this network is called the default mode network, shortened to DMN. So then when you gently dismiss the notifications, the salience network is activated as the mind wandering becomes salient and is brought into your awareness. Next, when you refocus on your breath, the activity of the TPN goes up while the DMN activity goes down, completing the cycle. Similar to weightlifting reps, this can be thought of as the mindfulness rep. So if we can remind ourselves of this, then many frustrations that are especially pronounced in the early stages of meditation can be avoided by understanding the true value driver here, which is developing the habit of awareness and then returning to the present, because this can be applied anywhere and everywhere. For example, you might find your mind wandering during this video, so you can start practicing right here by dismissing that notification and refocusing because the underlying shifting of network activity is associated with a nearly endless list of health benefits, which include greater focus, emotional resilience, sharper working memory, cognitive flexibility, enhanced immunity, protection from dementia, and much more that can be classified as things that slow down aging and essentially extend your life, which all result from reversing the 51% attack. So to help us understand that, first let's cover some basic neuroscience. The brain has 86 billion cells called neurons, and these neurons aggregate into regions that are modular, meaning that they're specialized to do certain things, such as the occipital lobe at the back of the brain that processes visual information. And the regions then go on to activate together as functional networks to carry out complex tasks, like focusing attention or mind wandering. So these functional networks are very dynamic and their activity adjusts to the demands on the brain in real time. And we can see this in the electrical activity of neurons, which occurs on the order of milliseconds. And this electrical neural activity is accompanied by blood flow as the neurons become more metabolically active and require oxygen. And this is known as the BOLD or the blood oxygen level dependent response, which can be detected using fMRI where the magnetic field measures the ratio between deoxygenated and oxygenated hemoglobin to signal which areas are more active than others. And when blood flows to multiple areas at the same time, these regions are said to be functionally connected as part of a functional network. So that's how the default mode network came to be discovered during resting state fMRI, which just means that as the subjects were lying down in the scanner, they were asked not to do anything, so they kind of just let their minds wander, hence the network discovered was task negative. And numerous studies showed how blood consistently flowed to the same regions under these conditions. And then in addition to mind wandering, the network was found to be active when people were remembering their pasts or planning for the future or thinking about others with respect to themselves, formerly known as theory of mind, and also during moral decision making. So it began to emerge that this network is active not only during automatic or default thinking, but also introspection and self-referential thinking or planning. And these are all important things we do on a daily basis. And in healthy brains, 
there is a dynamic equilibrium that exists between the default mode network and the task positive networks. These networks are intrinsically organized in an anti-correlated way so that when the activity of the default mode network goes up, the activity of the task positive network goes down, which intuitively makes sense. If our attention is directed inwardly and we're thinking about the past or the future, then we can't possibly attend to the present moment and the task at hand in the outside world. In the case of mindfulness, this is our breath. For this reason, after the salience network comes online to promote mindfulness and the awareness of mind wandering, the task positive network necessarily goes up. And because of anti-correlation, the default mode network activity goes down. Along with it, so does our internally directed attention and basically our time traveling to the experiences and memories of the past or the goals, desires, and the wishes of the future. And as a result, with our attention directed externally on the breath right here, right now, we are endowed with greater presence. On the other hand, a disequilibrium can lead to suffering. Mind wandering is healthy in moderation, but if done excessively and constrained on the past, it can turn into a rumination where we repeatedly and automatically begin to think about our problems and our feelings without being able to act on them. And these ruminations tend to be perceived in a negative way, also known as negative emotional valence, which correlates very strongly with depression. In fact, the default mode network is hyperactive and difficult to suppress in clinical depression. It leads to what is known as bottom-up emotional capture of attention. So despite attempting to focus while reading a book, for instance, a person in the throes of a depression might find themselves feeling guilty or self-critical about something tragic that happened to them, like a breakup or a job loss. And this relationship is a two-way street. The prefrontal cortex, the part of the TPN important in directing and sustaining attention, is hypoactive in clinical depression. As a result, top-down cognitive control over emotion is compromised. This can also be the case if we're feeling anxious, which happens when mind-wandering is excessive and constrained on the future. And we can see this in the form of a compromised salience network in anxiety, because one of the main regions in the network is the amygdala, which is involved in processing fear and threat-related stimuli. And it's hyperactive in the spectrum of anxiety disorders, including generalized anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, panic disorder, and various phobias. So again, this bottom-up emotional capture of attention essentially hijacks the prefrontal cortex in this scenario as well, and it leads a person to evaluate things in a defensive and neurotic manner, leading to persistent worries, even if they don't want to and are trying hard to focus elsewhere. And this is what is meant by the 51% attack, which is seen in distributed computing systems. These systems are comprised of many different computers called nodes that link up to form a network. If you're familiar with Bitcoin, then you're likely to understand this part intuitively because Bitcoin is a distributed network and so is the brain. So if you'd like to learn more about Bitcoin, feel free to click that link at the top right. But from a very high level view, the brain has been conceptualized as an inference or prediction engine that is constantly trying to decode information entering through the nervous system. For example, sensory input through the eyes. And it does this through hierarchical message passing along neurons, which come to represent nodes that relay and distribute information in the brain from areas that are lower in the cortex to the ones that are higher. And this is a prediction error that is relayed forward while a backwards prediction is communicated from the higher cortical areas. It's like a very complex game of telephone is being played as the nodes communicate back and forth with each other to try and explain away the message. For example, looking at this, the silhouette may lead you to believe that this shadow is formed because a person is blocking the light. So the prediction error is, I don't know how to explain the shadow, while the backwards prediction is, this shadow probably belongs to a person. But in the face of new information, the prediction error is updated, and so is the backwards prediction. So this communication between neurons occurs through chemical messengers called neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, and so forth. And these neurotransmitters are exchanged trustlessly without any third parties, just like Bitcoin is transacted on the Bitcoin network. Check out the link in the top right to learn about the significance of trust and value exchange without intermediaries. When a single entity gains control of more than 50% of the nodes on a network, the 51% attack allows that entity to dictate the operations of the entire network. Though this has never happened to the Bitcoin network, it's analogous to what happens in the brain. The default mode network essentially takes over, disrupts the equilibrium, and hijacks the brain's ability to effectively perform tasks, also known as executive functioning. And it's not only the default mode network, but the entire emotional neural circuitry because everything in the brain is intricately connected with each other. So who or what is this entity that is conducting the 51% attack? The default mode network has been proposed as a neurobiological basis of the ego by several influential neuroscientists. Ego functions include things like self-awareness and reality testing, which are largely consistent with default mode network functions. There's also significant overlap with the Nobel Prize winning behavioral economics research summarized in Thinking Fast and Slow particularly system one, which is fast, instinctive, emotional, and automatic, 
is very similar to the default mode network. In contrast, System 2, which is slow, logical, rational, and requires conscious effort, is analogous to the functions carried out by task-positive networks. For example, the question, what is your name, will activate System 1 as the response is fairly automatic, whereas if someone were to ask, can you repeat the months of the year in reverse order, System 2 would activate, as this requires conscious effort and executive functioning. And as we've seen, so does mindfulness meditation. By increasing TPN activity to focus on the breath, and through the anti-correlation, it down-regulates default mode network activity. Along with it, System 1 and the fast, instinctive, emotional, and automatic heuristics that make one susceptible to cognitive biases also stop overclocking. As a result, System 2 operations are unlocked and executive functioning is rescued. While ego functions and the maintenance of ego integrity are healthy for the psyche, a 51% attack by the ego can manifest as excessive attachment or identification with thoughts and feelings that can insidiously distort a person's reality and sense of self. Fortunately, this can also be undone with mindfulness practice. Quantifiably, mindfulness meditation downregulates default mode network activity, restores the equilibrium, and reverses the 51% attack at the network level. Then, the increased bandwidth frees up the prefrontal cortex to exert more top-down cognitive control over emotion, and the healthy balance is struck so that it's not so much emotional capture, but rather orientation of attention driven by bottom-up, stimulus-driven processes. Put another way, this helps us to be in tune with our emotions, because you want to be in a place where you have your feelings instead of your feelings having you. So how do we know that this indeed does happen after practicing mindfulness meditation? We know this because in the brain, neurons that wire together fire together, and that's what these connections are made of billions of neurons that are firing continuously to relay information via neurotransmitters and the more frequently they fire the stronger the wiring or the synaptic strength becomes as the amount of receptors and neurotransmitters is upregulated along those junctions a process known as long-term potentiation which is the basis for learning and memory so the more you meditate the easier it gets because your brain is literally rewiring itself to become more efficient and effective and mechanisms like this fall into the broader category of neuroplasticity and that right there is the proof of work that yields the health benefits of mindfulness meditation. This framework helps explain why studies have shown reduced activation in main areas of the default mode network, like the medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex in experienced meditators compared to those who don't meditate. Complementing these activation patterns is the density of neurons in these regions measured by the gray matter, which is also increased within the PCC and the left temporal parietal junction, another major node of the default mode network after eight weeks of mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR, for 20 minutes per day compared to controls. One potential interpretation here is that areas with more neurons require less energy, so it could reflect more efficient information processing and resource allocation. Increased cortical thickness was also found in the prefrontal cortex in regular meditators recruited from a local Western community. And you can see here that this was found in people well into their 40s and 50s compared to controls of the same age hinting at neuroprotective effects if the practice is maintained over time. On a similar token, eight weeks of MBSR led to increased gray matter in the hippocampus, the memory formation area that degenerates in Alzheimer's disease, adding more evidence of neuroprotection from dementia. The exact pathophysiology of Alzheimer's is not yet known, but we do know that greater stress will damage the hippocampus, so MBSR naturally antagonizes the harmful effects of stress on the brain. And we can see this register as reduced activity in the amygdala, the part of the salience network involved in processing fear and threat and awareness of mind wandering during mindfulness meditation. This is seen in people who have a disposition to mindfulness at baseline during a resting state, as well as in response to emotional pictures, which demonstrably elicits reactivity of the amygdala. We also see this pattern of reduced amygdala activation in people who were trained in an eight week program, and that too during a non-meditative state, promoting emotional resilience and suggesting that benefits lead to enduring changes that are process specific. And perhaps most encouragingly, this pattern was seen in patients with social anxiety disorder. These findings are indelibly significant in a much broader context of its impacts on the cardiovascular system, which is intricately linked with the nervous system from the amygdala along a series of connections in the hypothalamus and nuclei in the brainstem and medulla through the vagus nerve, which innervates the heart. This, along with cortical regions like the anterior cingulate cortex and prefrontal cortex, forms the central autonomic network. So that when we practice mindfulness, not only do we slow down psychologically, but also physiologically, as the reduced amygdala activation helps to slow down the heart rate and drop the blood pressure through parasympathetic nervous system input to the heart. 
We also see increased heart rate variability, which is a measure of the heart rate as it varies in between beats. This is very significant because low HRV is correlated with increased oral cause mortality. So basically an overall increased chance of dying from anything because low HRV is a leading indicator of various disease processes. So there is an argument to be made here that mindfulness can promote life extension through the downstream effects of increasing HRV. And because the hypothalamus is adjacent to the pituitary gland, mindfulness downregulates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or the HPA axis and the sympathetic adrenal axis as well. The result is a drop in the levels of adrenaline and cortisol and consequently stress-related risk of disease. And this includes depression as well. Chronic stress dysregulates this axis and the higher circulating levels of cortisol suppress our immune system. Mindfulness can counter this and indeed it has been shown to dampen cortisol levels in the morning and also the transcription factors that regulate activation of genes involved in inflammation, such as nuclear factor kappa B, while increasing anti-inflammatory components like the glucocorticoid receptor, and that too in cancer patients. The point here is that these effects exemplify the mind-body connection as we see the changes permeate all the way down the hierarchy of life to the level of chemicals and molecules, including telomeres, which are the caps at the ends of chromosomes that are a marker of aging. And the shortening of telomeres is seen in diseases like cancer. Indeed, the enzyme that prevents the shortening, called telomerase, had a 43% increase in its activity after mindfulness meditation in a pilot study. So we could go on and on about the overwhelming evidence and unpack it on many levels, but by now we've come to understand how these findings can be tied together into a coherent narrative that illuminates how function changes structure. Because it can be pretty easy to miss the forest for the trees when we isolate individual statistic data points. And importantly, we can see how we have complete control over this which paradoxically happens by letting go, by being less self-centered and observing life from a more third-person perspective, described as decentering in the literature. And it's no coincidence that this is similar to decentralization, as you are indeed reversing the 51% attack and decentralizing the governance of your psyche with respect to system one, the ego, and a variety of other metaphors that could be applicable here, but crucially, also in a mathematically quantifiable way, which can be analyzed through the default mode network. The neurosignature of decentering can manifest as an equilibrium of functional networks, and it facilitates detachment and greater presence, a mental state that is very similar to the state of flow, described by the psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Ultimately, mindfulness cultivates metacognition, which is thinking about thinking or becoming aware about your awareness. And that's why it's been described as having a superpower, because it's effectively helping us to get out of our own way. As we wrap up here, Another important point is that mindfulness meditation has been around for centuries, and therefore, it's characterized by the Lindy effect, which describes how technologies that have been around for a long time will continue to experience a longer life expectancy. And that's what mindfulness meditation is, a timeless attention training technology. So the fact that it has stood the test of time is a testament of the robust empirical evidence in favor of its benefits. And as we've seen now, statistical and clinical significance as well. So we should study these approaches from a complex dynamic systems perspective to comprehensively understand them. And finally, we live in a world full of distractions because in the age of information, some third party is always trying to monetize your attention span, whether it's the radio or the TV, but especially the internet. And as that information enters your brain, it subliminally and insidiously affects your mind. And in most cases, we're not even aware of it. So in addition to practicing mindfulness, I encourage everyone to check out the Brave Browser and the Basic Attention Token Project because this is yet another way of empowering yourself to take back control over your stream of consciousness and the 51% attack on your networks. To get started with Brave, you can click on the links below in the description. And in closing, thank you for sustaining your attention. Please hit subscribe and share this video if you found it valuable. And here are the references if you'd like to read up further. Please contact a mental health professional if you are acutely experiencing thoughts of hurting yourself or someone else. You can also contact the National Suicide Hotline. The information in this video does not constitute professional medical advice in the absence of a therapeutic alliance and a patient-physician relationship.